It's Ivy Slater, and you're listening to Her Success Story Podcast, a show where gutsy businesswomen share their success journey. Hello, it's Ivy Slater, and welcome to Her Success Story. Thrilled you could join us here today. I have a colleague, an, an amazing woman, Rita Burgett Martell is an international executive coach, um, organizational change management consultant, author. She has two books out. I'm going to do a couple of brief highlights, and all her bio will be in the show notes because she is so accomplished and has so many years. I'd rather talk to Rita than just read to you about Rita. Um, <laughs> Rita has been, you know, in this industry. She works with Fortune 500 clients, um, including every from lead, senior leadership teams of Cisco, the Gap, Genetex, a um, few different pharmaceutical companies, on and on and on, a few different banks. She works in the United States, in the Netherlands, UK, Belgium, uh, Bali, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The one thing I really have loved to, about Rita as I've slowly but surely gotten to know her is how she views the world business in the current and present tense and how she brings this into the work she does in change management and the executive work she does. So Rita, welcome and thank you for being here today. Oh, thanks for the invitation. So um, give us, you know, give us this overview of your, of, of your background. And, and, you know, very often one of the early questions I'll ask somebody is, you know, what did we hope to be when we grow, grew up? And then how did, in the world did we end up here? So you have a, a fabulous information, a very fabulous background and story around that. Please share that. Okay. Yeah, I sometimes think I've had three different lifetimes. And they've all been wonderful, uh, different and special in different ways. Um, grew up in Nashville and grew up in a, a family that was lower middle class. No one in my family had graduated from high school until I came along, let alone think about college. So from a very early age, I was encouraged to find a good husband and keep him. That was the definition of success. If you kept him, then that would be all you would hope for in life. So when I graduated from high school, I was given a scholarship that would have paid for my entire four years of college. But I'd also met my future husband when I was 16, and he had asked me to marry him. So I have my family saying, well, you don't need that education. He's going to be a good husband. And back then, we didn't think that you could have a career and a marriage. And you certainly couldn't go to college if you were married. It was just a different mindset. And in the South, just a different kind of mentality. So I remember the day I called the organization that gave me the scholarship and said, I'm getting married. I won't be going to college and having this sick feeling in the pit of my stomach, but really not seeing a choice doing what I had been taught to do. And I was in love with my future 20 year old husband. So anyway, we settled into married life. I had my daughter, first daughter, two years later, second daughter, five years after that, and then um, settled into life as a wife and mother, decided to take a part-time job because I was just a little bored, and um, went to work for an insurance company, met a woman who was my age, which at that time was 29, and she was going to college. And I said, my God, that's amazing. I didn't know they would let you in college after you were 18. And I really didn't because adults weren't going back to school then. And she said, yeah. And, and you know, you're, you're a thousand percent right because our perception of growing, when we were growing up is you go to high school from these years to these years, you go to mm -hmm. middle school or junior high back in the day from these years to these years. So w wouldn't college be the same? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I was just, I mean, it, for me, that like opened up a whole world of possibilities. She was my age. She had two children. Um, she was divorced but she was going to college, they let her in. And I thought, my gosh, it's possible. So I have to see how it's possible for me. So I signed up for a couple of classes at a community college, 
my husband just kind of ignored that, thinking it would be a passing fad. But when I, I made A's in both of them, and one of them was accounting, I thought, oh, I think I might be able to do this. So that's where the rubber hit the road and the conversation with my husband about, I want to go to college. And it was like, no, you can't, um, you don't need this. You have me to take care of you. So well, what if something happens to you? Well, then you can take over the insurance agency. We had started an agency you know, together. And I said, well, okay, um, what if we, that's if you die, what if we divorce? And he said, but I'll never leave you. And I said, well, what if I leave you? Is the insurance agency mine? And he said, well, no, that's my business. So it wasn't the best conversation, but I could kind of see that my only security was if he died, that really I had nothing that was mine. And I, at that moment, I just had this determination, I will go to college, I will graduate, I will graduate at the top of my class. <laughs> it wasn't enough just to go to college, I had to be summa cum laude. And that's exactly what happened, it took five years to get through four years because I had to work to pay for school. He refused to use any of the family's money to pay for something I didn't need. Met with a lot of resistance from family who thought I was selfish and shouldn't be doing this. I would lose my husband, my children would turn out to be delinquents, but I was so determined. And when I graduated, um, I did, I graduated summa cum laude and <laughs> highest grade point average in the class. It was like an amazing wow. moment. And I thought, oh my God, I can't, I did this. I can't believe I did this. And I mean, the marriage, our marriage was really based on family values. <laughs> you hear that talked about a lot, but it, it, it was. We valued our family. We were both re really good parents. Our daughters are wonderful. They turned out to be amazing young women. And right. so that was what we shared. Um, from there, I was so highly motivated to help every woman in Nashville change her life <laughs> because I just thought if every woman knew she could, she would. So I started a women's center in Nashville. That was the mid eighties. It was a very radical thing to do. Um, so like, hold on, repeat this again. You started what exactly? Uh, it was a center for women. I called okay. I called it a woman's place because I was so tired of people telling me where my place was. And also I wanted women to feel like they had a place to go where they could get support and encouragement to make positive changes. Because women were told if you, um, you should be happy with what you have. And if you have a husband, and he doesn't drink, he doesn't beat you, he pays the bills. What more could you want? And so women were made to feel guilty for um, not being satisfied with what they had uh, and for wanting more. And so my message was, you can be happy with what you have. You can be grateful for what you have. And that doesn't mean that you can't continue to grow and you can bring more people and more knowledge and more challenge into your life. So, so struck a you nerve. You opened this woman's center, how, probably were you in your young to mid thirties at this time? Uh-huh, yeah, I was 30, 34 when okay. I started this. And it was a bookstore. Um, I sold books uh, written for women, self-help books, books on you know, self-image, assertiveness, a lot was happening around that time. Women going into management, the first. And then I brought in different experts in Nashville to teach classes on um, self-confidence, on projecting poise and power and you know, management leadership skills for women and you know, just kind of making it up as I went along. I was and, just gonna say, so you know, this is, um, especially during this time frame, you know, the idea of confidence classes and self-confidence leadership skills, there, there really wasn't talked about in that way during this time no. at all. No, not at all. And people would always say, well, if you become too confident, you'll be arrogant and you'll be uppity and nobody likes an uppity woman. And, <laughs> and then with the uh, assertiveness, um, I could not use the word assertive. 
I had to use communicating clearly and confidently or something right. to that effect. So, so then what, ha you know, jump forward a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so then companies started asking me to come in and do workshops for their female employees. They wanted to teach women leadership skills so they could be prepared to move up to different levels of management. So that okay. opened up a whole new business for me and got me into the world of corporate training. And uh, suddenly I had two businesses going on. Um, then a third business started because I started doing a lot of professional speaking and learned that you can charge a fee for that and you can, can make good money. And that led to a lot of traveling. And it was like one thing supported another and doors opened up and I wouldn't know who I would be on the other side, but I would go ahead and walk through that door. And, and that's then, also, I want to uh, pause here for a second because mm -hmm. that's a tribute because, you know, I, I think we're both in this perspective. Opportunity is everywhere if we're opened mm -hmm. to receive it. And you were very open. You were out in the world saying, I'm ready, you know, universe deliver and I'm taking action. Mm -hmm. I am taking action. I'm taking action consistently and I'm open to learning and growing and Bring, you know, bring it on. And hence it was delivered. And I think that's, you know, it's a little woo and it's not necessarily a place that we always really go here. But I think it's important to understand that there has to be an openness to us in opportunity. There definitely does. And what I have learned over and over is if you have this strong feeling, if, and if you make the commitment to do something, what you need will be there when you need it. It may be like the very last moment when you're down to your last dollar, but you will be taken care of. It will, it will work out. And that's happened to me so many times. And the people who come into your life are people who will help you move to the next level because the people who know you as you are today can have a vested interest in keeping you the way you are today. And if you have a desire to continue to learn and grow and expand your world, it can be threatening to them. So you meet, need to meet new people who are where you want to be or look like they're heading there. Right. And they can support you along the way. So um, one thing I want to be sure and mention, I, it was this amazing organization that I was able to become an active part of. At, at the end of the 80s, um, 1989, and that was the National Association of Women Business Owners, NABO. NABO. It's yeah. important to know about these things, listeners. Yeah. Know yeah. the associations and know the associations that are there to support us and we've become involved in. It was amazing because I didn't know a lot of, of women business owners. There really weren't a lot in Nashville at the time. And so um, another woman and I, heard about NABO and thought, we want to meet other women like us, so let's start a local chapter. And we did. And then I was the president of the, the founding chapter in Nashville, and then the following year was elected to the national board of directors. So all of a sudden, I had friends all over the United States, other women business owners, who had, you know, sold their car like I did to get the money to start a business or gone into debt or gotten involved in lawsuits or, you know, had chills waking up in the middle of the night, how am I going to meet payroll? So, you know, these were women who were risk takers and they weren't threatened. We weren't threatened by each other because we were all out there, you know, making things happen. That just put me in touch with so many amazing women. So I think it's extremely important when you feel like it's time for you to grow to the next level, to look at different organizations and different groups that you can become a part of. Um, so it will support you in that growth and doors, uh, doors will open. So tell me a little bit more about, um, or uh, actually let's transition to the the next steps in your life. So you had all this going on in Lasville. Your kids were growing up. Mm -hmm. every, every you know your husband was running the insurance agency, mm -hmm. and um, you you were running a women's center. You were being being brought in for corporate training. You realized that you could be actually hired and paid to speak as a speaker that we both do. 
-hmm. Okay, what happens next in this woman that is unexpectedly growing a major business model? Yes, well, I have a couple of speaking engagements in California. One was in Los Angeles and the other was in San Diego. Um, that, that was my first couple of years in Navo on the national board and I had made friends in California. So I thought I'm just gonna visit my friends and in between speaking engagements and not go back to Nashville and come back again. So I planned to be there for a couple of weeks. Um, during my, my speech in Los Angeles, I, I think it, that it's on the topic of goal setting or you know something like that. And I mentioned, and I, I'd only made one trip before that to California and I just liked it. I thought, wow, this seems like a place where you could really be who you are. <laughs> and in the South, you kind of had to make it work, you know, and not be too threatening to men, um, which gets old after a while. But anyway, I, during my speech, I said something about my West Coast office. <laughs> I thought, oh my God, I can't believe I just, <laughs> I don't have a West Coast office. But anyway, it was like all these things going on in my head while, you know, words are coming out of my mouth. My mouth. <laughs> um, so anyway, at the, at the end of my speech, this woman came up and she said, I'm so happy to hear that you've expanded your business to the West Coast because we've been looking for someone like you. And since you're here anyway, why don't you come talk to my manager tomorrow and just explore the possibility of a consulting contract with us. <laughs> so I did. That goes and back to being open. Yes, <laughs> I did. And they offered me a three month consulting contract right on the spot. <laughs> so, okay, I think I, I think I should talk to my husband. Um, so I said, I'll let you know tomorrow. So I called my husband and said, this is, this is what's happened. What do you think? And I mean, great guy, great guy that he is. And he had, he had grown, you know, he had grown with my growth that had spurred him on a little bit. And he said, well, I know you, you like it there. And, you know, this, it could work. I, I can come out in a few weeks and then you'll come back. And it's only three months, you know, yeah, we'll, we'll make it work. And that was when my oldest daughter was getting married. My youngest daughter was leaving for college. And it was like, that was the time where I thought, maybe it's my turn. Maybe it's my turn. Um, so anyway, I took the consulting contract. The three month contract lasted three years. Um, ended up, I was in Southern California for the first year and then went up to San Francisco from that point on and uh, lived in San Francisco for 27 years. Um, and the marriage lasted for another year and it was just a bridge too far, just a bit too much for my husband to grow. Couldn't grow all the way to California. So it was, um, you know, it was a happy parting. It was, we, we said we came together to have this family. We had this great life. We had these two wonderful daughters what we don't have is a shared vision of the future. And he didn't want to hold me back and I didn't want to hold myself back. So it was, it was the best of times and it was the worst of times. You know, all the emotional roller coaster you can imagine. But that again, put me into a whole new phase of life that was amazing and led to a lot of global travel, doing work with clients I never thought would be listening to me advising them on multi-million billion dollar projects and I don't know it was just I suddenly became this expert on change and it was just really understanding and experiencing what I had gone through myself and then also working with so many women in the Women's Center in Nashville and then going into companies and working with companies who were downsizing and restructuring and being able to transfer that knowledge and those skills to any type of change, whether it was post-merger integration, implementing large technology systems or standardizing processes, changes change, people are people, um, same experience. 
So tell me today, you know, where do you see um, companies on the big scale as well as small business embracing change? Well, the, the younger generation is more open to it than baby boomers were because baby boomers were brought up with, the, with parents who were lived during the depression and focused on security. So, you know, you, you got married and stayed married, which of course we didn't do. <laughs> Highest divorce rate of any generation. Right. Um, but you did a job and you kept it. And so when companies started doing all of their re-engineering and I mean, CEOs started slashing here and there in order for the, the profits and shake, shake, um, stakeholder value to go up, shareholder value to go up, then people started losing their jobs. And it wasn't because they did a bad job. It was because the company was combining regions or closing a region or just eliminating that whole department. It's traumatic for people. So, I mean, that was our generation. We really were not prepared for that. Um, the millennial generation grew up seeing their parents not get very much for being loyal. And so this um, millennial generation is really more open to change, embracing change. I um, started working with a client um, yesterday who works for Google, and he was telling me that Facebook is, is recruiting people from Google. And so what employees are doing, they're leaving Google and going to Facebook, staying there for a year or two, and then going back to Google, and they, get, they go back and forth, and that's their strategy to make changes because they get a big salary bump when they do. <laughs> My generation never would have done that. It was, correct. I will be loyal, and you will give me job security. So it's um, the whole idea of where security comes from, I think, is being redefined as we go into this gig economy and the emphasis on the knowledge worker. So yeah, companies are, change is just uh, a business strategy. It, it, it is part of your strategy, it's gonna happen. And the work that I did as an organizational change consultant really does need to become a capability that each manager has. So they know how to prepare their employees for change. And so that's what I see evolving. There will always be the need for consultants, but it really is a capability that everyone needs. Everyone needs. I, I couldn't agree more. And, um, you know, in the evolution, if we really look at business and take a step back and look at business, um, the last X amount of years, close to 10 years, the technology revolution that's going on is advancing business at a rate that to me, and this is a personal um, observation, uh, of the industrial res revolution back in the day. Mm -hmm. And so business is changing rap rapidly. Our generations um, change. Curious question here, where does, with all the, the development change and growth, in, do you see a difference in the younger generation in the fear factor of this versus not and how they handle that? I don't think they have the fear that we did. Um, and when I worked with clients who had lost their job, I did outplacement um, counseling for um, a year or so, and you know, there was so much downsizing. What I noticed is if someone had been working for a company for five years or longer, right. they had no idea that other companies existed. <laughs> they had idea what other job they could possibly possibly get because that company had become their whole world and they they weren't going outside of the company you know to do networking because they were working long hours and you wanted to have some time to spend with your family so um yeah it was just different different values different mindset different different possibilities i think that millennials see that I mean, the technology change that they've come to live with, you know, a new, a new phone, what, every year? Or, you know, um, all these new gadgets come out all the time, and they're continually learning very quickly to use the, the next technology. So, yeah, I think they are. 
much more open to it than we were and less, less fearful. So what types of tips do you have for our listeners? in the embracing of change and the, the building of our unique brands, whether we are in corporate America or, or for business owners? I think what's extremely important is to, to remain as relevant and current as you can. And you can't remain current if you aren't keeping up to date on what's going on in your industry or in your profession. And I mean, with the internet, it is so easy to keep up with what's going on. You can subscribe to all these different newsletters. I, I have several of them because I work with clients across industries. So I want to stay on top of what changes are taking place in certain industries, what, uh, how professions are changing. I've had a lot of clients who are in the human resource area. It's a whole lot of changes in HR taking place. Mm -hmm jobs being, roles being redefined. Um, and of course in IT, there's always a lot of change in IT. I think it's embracing a way of thinking that is more about sustaining your career instead of looking for job security. Because a company, there's no company that will provide you with job security and there's no real profession. Security comes from your ability and your willingness to continually learn new things. And it comes from understanding the skills that you have that are transferable. So it's, and, and there's a book that was written not too long ago called Range. And in Range, the author talks about how it's not so good to be an expert anymore, that you need a wide range of skills because new opportunities are being created, others are going away. And so if, uh, you know, if you think you're, you're changing jobs too often or changing careers too often or getting a lot of experience doing a lot of different things and not specializing in any one thing, that's not bad because you're developing new skills and you're learning and you're staying relevant. So I, I embrace that way of thinking as well. So yeah, it's being aware of what's going on. And I mean, for me, I never imagined when I started college and I, I never imagined all the changes that I would experience. Or when I started the Women's Center in Nashville, I mean, my vision didn't go beyond Nashville. I never imagined that what I would be learning, working with so many women who wanted to make changes but didn't know how, to know how to deal with all the repercussions and have the confidence to move forward even when they were you know, scared to death. Um, I had no idea that that was preparing me to work with C-level executives and some of the top companies. And I mean, it was just, it was transferring my knowledge, um, transferring my skills to different markets and to different types of changes that were taking place. So that's what I mean about career sustainability. I was able to sustain a very good career, um, you know, by looking at different areas where I could apply those skills and not really knowing it in advance, just being willing to say yes and thinking I'll figure it out. And if I don't, I'll just go back to doing what I did before. So I want to, um, Stop this right here because I think the greatest tip you shared right now, Rita, is the tip to just say yes. Mm -hmm. When opportunity yeah. is in front of us, when we say yes and you come with that, we'll, we'll refer to it as a Rita attitude, I'll, and I'll just figure it out. I can't, I'll go back to doing what I'll do. You know, uh, how do, that's the greatest way to move forward. How to move our businesses forward, our careers forward, our lives forward. Say yes. Yes. And if things don't work out, then you, you will survive. You will. And you will learn. Trust us. We've both been around the block and we've both survived. <laughs> <laughs> yes. 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 I love it. I love it. Rita, share with our audience uh, how they um, best ways to follow you, keep in touch with you, learn more about you. Oh, well, of course, LinkedIn is always a great way to connect, Rita Burgett Martell. And then my email is coachrita365 at gmail.com. I have two books on Amazon, 
and you can just look up my name on Amazon, my author site. I have a lot of articles that I've posted on my author site that um, you can download for free, and there's a link to my blog. And I'm also doing um, a webinar on, uh, let's see, October, the last Saturday in October. I on... don't know if this will be airing by then, so pause <laughs> uh, that. Okay. But just okay. stay tuned to Rita's website and see what she has current going on. Be in contact with her. Learn more. Most importantly, embrace the opportunity. Embrace the change. See change as growth and say yes. So thank you for saying yes to her success story and joining us here today. Um, please remember to subscribe. Let us know what interests you. Let us know who else you want to hear from. That's how we bring, continue to bring you wonderful, wonderful guests that we're incredibly lucky to have. Um, see you next time. Thank you for joining us on Her Success Story.